Hello, welcome everyone. My name is Rafa Shams. I'm the Director of Communications and Programming at the Academic Engagement Network. Thank you all for being here. I wish we were coming together for AEN's second webinar of the academic year under better circumstances. Unfortunately, we are here at an extremely challenging time. We are reeling from the terrorist attacks of October 7th, its unspeakable images spread throughout social media platforms like a virus. And we are thinking of our friends, families, and colleagues in Israel who have been impacted. We are watching in further horror at the explosion of anti-Semitism around the world, which followed the attacks, including perhaps most acutely on the college and university campuses on which we do our professional work. From the moment we learned of this unspeakable tragedy, AEN mobilized its faculty members to respond. That is the topic of today's webinar, October 7th and its impact on US campuses and the academy, reflections from AEN faculty members. At this extraordinarily difficult time for Israel and the Jewish people, a time when many of us are seeking community but also accurate scholarly information and resources, I hope that for our faculty members, our partners and our supporters, AEN has provided a little bit of both. Before we hear from our panelists, I'm going to turn it over now to AEN's executive director, Dr. Miriam Elman, who will say a few additional words. Thank you so much, Rafa, and thank you so much to all of our panelists and to all of you for joining today. We are recording a number of our members and supporters uh, couldn't make it, they're teaching or they have other obligations and they will be able to hear it later. Uh, one month ago, a great evil was visited upon Israel and the Jewish people. And we thought that now four weeks later, we could bring AN members together to reflect on what we've been experiencing and how we've been intervening and engaging on our campuses and in the wider academy. Before we begin, I really would like to give some thanks. Those speaking on today's panel and those of you who've joined the call have shown incredible resolve and resilience over the past four weeks. You've done so much to support beleaguered, distraught, and often traumatized Jewish and Israeli students and faculty colleagues and staff too. We've been moved in AAN's leadership team. We've been inspired by your dedication to your students and to the Academy's bedrock principles of reasoned argument and civil and respectful discourse on campus. In the first weeks of October, as AAN's leadership team worked to get information out to our network, over two thirds of our faculty members access the fact and resource materials that we were preparing. Hundreds of AEN faculty members on nearly 70 campuses took direct action during the first 10 days of the crisis. Then over 150 members came together in closed door sessions of our 14 sections and interest groups where they provided each other with support and discussed effective response strategies and tactics. And on the campuses where day of resistance rallies and walkouts and protests occurred, you also stepped up. On so many campuses, what we saw were demonstrations where incendiary and hateful anti-Semitic rhetoric was on full display. Events that were ostensibly to support Palestinian rights and justice, but which became hate fests in support of Hamas. Our members stood up and spoke out, intervening in a variety of ways to address this hate. And you, our members, have written and fielded faculty statements, petitions, open letters on campuses across the country, from Harvard, CUNY, Yale, to Penn, Northwestern, Berkeley, and dozens more. We've been adding up the numbers here in AN's leadership team, and to date, we're counting nearly 4,000 faculty who have signed these AN organized statements. Truly incredible work. Thank you for providing such a strong faculty voice of moral clarity. This afternoon, you'll hear from four members who have engaged in different ways on different types of campuses and in a range of disciplines. And we hope that you will be inspired as we have been by their actions, by their commitment, by their dedication to AEN's mission and goals. Before I turn the floor back to Rafa to introduce our speakers, I just wanna give a shout out to my team, 
to AN's incredible staff. With the amount of work we get done, people think we have 20 or more staff, even dozens I heard the other day. Can your media team do this or that? We don't have a media team. We have Rafa Shams, who is on our call, right? It's just the six of us in AN's leadership team, and we're punching above our weight. I'm incredibly fortunate to work with such a dedicated group of colleagues in AN staff. And with that, Rafa, I am turning it back to you. Okay. Thank you, Miriam. Um, so as I said, um, you know, as, as Miriam said, we will hear from four faculty members who are going to share what they observed on their campuses and within their academic communities in the aftermath of October 7, what they did to respond and the impact of their work. Um, before I do that, I just want to make a special announcement about AEN's emergency microgrant program. Um, as Miriam said, our uh, our faculty are, respond, uh, are responding to this to this crisis in in a myriad of ways, and and we want to be there, uh, providing resources to them in their in their time of need. And so we have an emergency micro grant program available to our members who want to create innovative and important programming that seek to change the narrative on campuses. So please stay tuned for more information on that. Um, so now I want to introduce our distinguished panelists. I'm just going to do it briefly because they they have uh, uh, very uh, extensive biographies, and it would take it would take the whole webinar to go through all of their accomplishments. So we have Julie Ansis, a distinguished professor in the Department of Informatics at the New Jersey Institute of Technology. Jeffrey Blutinger, professor and director of Jewish Studies at California State University, Long Beach. Brian Englander, Robert E. Campbell, Associate Professor of Radiology at the Perelman School of Medicine, University of Pennsylvania. And finally, Alan Levinson, the Schusterman Josie State Chair of Ju Judaic History at the University of Oklahoma. So thank you so much to Julie, Jeffrey, Brian, and Alan for being here with us, for sharing your insights and expertise. Following the presentations, there will be an opportunity for Q&A. Please hold your questions until all the presentations are complete. Then you can type in your questions in the chat or use the raised hand emoji. So without any further ado, Julie, over to you. Okay. Well, thank you, Rafa and Miriam for inviting me to be on this panel and talk with you today. Um, I am a distinguished professor at New Jersey Institute of Technology, uh, which is a public R1 university. I'm also the founder and director of a group called Psychologists Against Anti-Semitism, which is a, a topic for another time. Uh, NJIT is a polytechnic institution with approximately 9,000 students and more than 125 undergraduate and graduate programs. The New York Times ranked NJIT number one among all public universities nationally in terms of economic mobility. We have a very diverse student body, and the campus is relatively apolitical, as most STEM institutions are. One exception that I'm aware of is in 2022, a group called Divest NJIT released a statement demonizing Israel and condemning the university partnership that we have with Ben Gurion University. This is my fourth year at NJIT. Uh, last year, we hired a new president, and this year we have a new provost. Uh, last year, a chief diversity officer was also hired for the first time, and he is building his office. With regard to recent events in Israel, on October 10th, 2023, the NJIT president sent out a tweet. He tweeted that he was, quote, deeply saddened by the recent violence and loss of life in Israel and Gaza, and that his thoughts were with all those whose lives are in peril, uh, as well as his hopes for a peaceful resolution. Uh, so there was no statement, just that tweet at that point. On October 12th, 21 faculty at NJIT signed on to a letter sent to the pre president urging him to provide a statement condemning the terrorist actions of Hamas and assert that NJIT stands firmly with Israel and concerned community leaders. 
It was pointed out in this letter that this would be in line with previous NJIT presidents who have issued statements on world and national events, not directly affecting NJIT, but of great importance to many on campus. In addition to that, several faculty members individually wrote directly to the president describing their personal experiences of being Jewish, of anti-Semitism, and urging a statement which included a denouncement of Hamas and a message of support for the safety of the Jewish campus community. On October 12th, the president sent out an email to the NJIT community um, and I quote, uh, he talked about the tragedy in Israel, Gaza, and beyond following heinous acts of terror that included unconscionable violence and the degradation of innocent people and which have resulted in the loss of thousands of human lives. He offered his sympathy and indicated, another quote, that the best action I could take at this time is to uphold NJIT's core values and foster a climate of civility one in which we hear and contemplate one another's diverse views, treat each other with respect and honor, but unequivocally denounce violence, terror, and the inhumane acts that rob us of our individual and collective dignity. Many faculty thought that the president's statement was not strong enough in terms of its condemnation of Hamas and expression of solidarity with the Jewish community. Around the same time, faculty at NJIT initiated um, or created a Google group um, composed of mostly Jewish faculty as well as staff to help coordinate communications with each other. Uh, there are 75 members of that group and we call ourselves the new Jewsy group. I didn't come up with that name, uh, but it's stuck. On October 15th, the president sent a follow-up message to the campus community uh, in a newsletter he condemned Hamas and he listed some campus resources, including links to the counseling center, the Dean of Students office and the employee assistance program. However, faculty were concerned that there was no mention of support for safety of the Jewish campus community and inclusion of Jews and anti-Semitism in DNI efforts. In the meantime, we became aware of social media postings of a violent an anti-Semitic nature by an NJIT student. At that point, we spoke to uh, campus police. On October 16th, this new, new Jewsy group met online to discuss concerns and reactions to the administrators, uh, administration's letters. And we decided that a meeting with the administration was in order. Uh, on October 18th, 27 Jewish and non-Jewish faculty, staff, and student leaders at NJIT sent a letter to the president respectfully requesting an urgent meeting with him and relevant members of the senior leadership to voice our concerns and hear from him about what concrete steps NJIT would be taking to number one, protect the physical safety of any member of the NJIT community, NJIT community who feel threatened by the current situation. Number two, curb any hate and malicious statements by members of the NJIT community, which could potentially lead to violent acts on campus. In addition, we indicated that we recently became aware of a number of extreme anti-Jewish statements made on social media by a small number of NJIT students. We also uh, indicated that we have resources and recommendations to help ensure the safety of the Jewish community at NJIT. Uh, on October 18th, um, I, should, I should make mention that at an institute faculty meeting, our new provost provided um, a rather lengthy statement uh, denouncing terror and uh, vocalizing support for the uh, community at NJIT. Uh, we also had this new Juicy group had a meeting with our chief of police expressing our concerns with regard to safety. And then we started to see some hateful flyers posted around our campus um, with the statement or the tagline, honoring the martyrs of Palestine. Uh, the president's office responded to us right away uh, in terms of our request for an urgent meeting. And we had an online meeting 
on October 23rd with the president, the provost, the chief diversity officer, the university attorney, um, and the head of the Dean of Students office. We reiterated our concerns regarding safety. Um, and something I have not mentioned yet is that we have um, continue to have great concerns regarding the formation of a Students for Justice in Palestine chapter on our campus. Um, and we wanted to also uh, ask that the leadership guarantee that university resources will not be used to create, promote, or disseminate department statements that impugn Israel or Zionism. We were told that NJIT does not support hate or anti-Semitism, and that any SJP chapter would need to go through the formal process for approval and an informed decision would be made. So we met for about an hour with the administration and we're told that we could meet again if desired. Uh, we have sent the administration a lot of information, both in meetings and in emails regarding SJP, the National Day of Resistance Toolkit that was distributed by the National SJP um, and the state of Jewish students across college campuses, as well as uh, AEN's training related to anti-Semitism. Uh, subsequent to that meeting, the chief diversity officer reached out to me to meet. We, we uh, met for some time about um, mostly me talking about the situation in Israel, what that meant for many Jews, anti-Semitism, uh, the definition of Zionism, and the need for us to really feel supported and included in d &I initiatives, uh, which, is often not the case. We haven't heard anything further from the administration since, and we've begun to draft another letter to the administration with um, some requests, including uh, publishing an explicit warning to our community that no form of anti-Semitism or other discrimination will be tolerated on campus. Um, that a person be appointed who is educated and informed about Jewish issues, including anti-Semitism, um, and who could employ Jewish affirming strategies to the DEI uh, and D Dean of Students offices on campus, uh, to implement anti-Semitism anti training for campus administrators and staff, including all DNI professionals at NJIT. Um, and again, uh, talking about or appointing uh, administrators to the AEN training. Um, I should say that uh, the Dean of Students Office uh, responded to me, uh, thanking me and saying that they were going to send their staff to uh, AEN training or the, um, I forget what you call it, Miriam, the, the day that is coming up to talk about sort of AEN efforts for uh, university leaders. Um, and the uh, chief diversity officer said he would sign up as well. Um, we also like to request that, um, again, a guarantee that university resources will not be used to create, promote, or disseminate any individual or department statements with a political nature, um, including academic boycotts, uh, a request to ensure the safety and security of the NGI, NJIT Jewish community, um, as well as a couple of other requests. So I'll end there that that's the state of affairs up until uh, today. Thank you so much, Julie. Um, this is a very inspiring model of how academics who are part of an organized network can use a combination of their scholarly expertise and their own assertiveness to create change on their campus. Um, now I want to turn it over to, to, to our next presenter, uh, Jeff Blutinger. Hi, uh, thank you so much uh, for hosting this and for inviting me. And I want to thank particularly uh, Miriam. Um, I Right before all this hit the fan, about a week before, I had said something on campus about the ADL and there was some pushback from the usual suspects uh, condemning the ADL. And I quickly wrote her saying, you know, because I've been to one of these uh, mini conferences from AEN and we had heard about, you know, the various campaigns against the ADL uh, involving what is a deadly exchange and so on. So I knew about it, but I didn't have all the details at my fingertips. And I dashed off an email to Miriam who quickly responded and I was able to rebut that. 
And I see Spencer is also on this call and I wanna thank Spencer. I am the, I should explain that I am the, what is the term? Uh, sec, California section head of AEN this year. A, a position I reluctantly accepted in September before any of this happened. And so now I found myself, you know, trying to coordinate. And we had a meeting uh, shortly after every uh, October 7th. And one of the things that came out of that, because um, I mentioned I'll talk about, we have a, a Jewish affinity group on our campus. And um, I'm, I have a meeting on Monday over Zoom with uh, CSULA, which is creating its own now Jewish affinity group in response uh, sort of that came out of that meeting. Um, I should explain that Cal State, I were, I'm director of Jewish studies at Cal State Long Beach. I've been here 19 years. Uh, CSULB is, we're sort of in a competition with San Diego State for which is the largest university in California, where we're about 33,000 students. Uh, we're primarily a teaching school. Uh, we're not an R1, so we, the base is 4-4, four, four, for those of you uh, know what that means. Um, we um, we train more teachers at Cal State Long Beach than the rest of the UC system combined. Uh, we we train the nurses, we train the engineers, we train the teachers, we train uh, people going into the police field or law enforcement. Um, so we do a lot of, uh, that's really what we do. So we are an Hispanic serving uh, campus. I believe we are a majority Hispanic population. Most of our students are first generation. Uh, that is first generation college students. Uh, and we're the basically the engine that moves people into the middle class. Our campus historically has been very quiet during the V. I've been told by people who were here during the Vietnam War that there was nothing happened on campus during the Vietnam War. When I started on campus in 2004, uh, when we talked about anti-Israel uh, campuses with an anti-Israel, anti-Semitic problem, we were usually talking about UC Irvine just down the road. Uh, and people would say in the community, what's it like? We hear that everything's really bad on college campuses. I said, well, it's it's really quiet here, you know? We get the apartheid wall once a year as it makes its tour of the California schools, but that's about it. Um, 2017, there was a BDS movement, uh, which actually succeeded, unfortunately. Uh, we had our campus president, who's still the same president now, uh, Jane Connolly, was very strong in speaking out against it. Uh, you know, I was sitting right next to her at the, at, you know, at the at students uh, Senate uh, to speak against the uh, the bill. Uh, 2020, the student Senate did actually adopt the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism. Unfortunately, they're now trying to repeal that. Um, so that's sort of just the background. Why at campus? We used to have an SJP, but then it kind of went away. And then October 7th happened. Uh, and within two days of October, on October 9th, uh, flyers were distributed on campus and posted to Instagram, uh, which announced uh, first that there was going to be a pro-Palestine rally on the 10th, and then the day before, uh, there would be a poster-making session. And both announcements, flyers, included um, images of paragliders. Uh, that is the, uh, those are, if, for those of you unfamiliar, uh, the, the peace concert uh, was attacked by terrorists on paragliders, which who massacred 240 or uh, people, I think, at that particular concert. And so this was a specific explicit image of terrorism uh, that was included on campus media. Now, this was being promoted originally by La Fuerza, which is a student group, which is the successor organization to Mecha. So this was coming out of the Chicano Latino studies groups. Uh, and that's when we learned that there was a, uh, then uh, quickly followed by the formation of a new SJP chapter on our campus. Um, the march that they organized uh, explicitly had a lot of eliminationist uh, rhetoric. The, the chants that you've all heard, right, uh, from the, what is it, from the river to the sea, and then the followed up by there is only one solution, Intifada revolution. And to which I, I summed, apparently final solution didn't fit the rhyming scheme. So they went with one solution instead. Uh, but if, if even if you could make some sort of argument, tangentious argument that from the river of the sea wasn't meant to be violent, uh, there's no way follow, compare when you pair that with intifada and revolution, those are both explicitly violent. Um, this was immediately followed. Uh, we have had four pro-Palestinian teach-ins on campus organized by a particular faculty. 
Uh, these are um, these teach-ins are co-sponsored by SJP uh, or uh, the C. We have uh, in California the California Faculty Association. We discovered now has a interest group uh, for Palestinians, uh, and they did their own uh, event uh, teach-in. Uh, we actually have an event today. Uh, we have today we are having uh, we've had, I think, four uh, marches on campus where well, the fourth one is today. It's paired with a talk uh, by J uh, a speaker from JVP who's making a tour of California campuses. She's going to Northridge right after us. Uh, that one's called Not In My Name. Um, and we've had anti-Semitic petitions. Uh, the first one was put out by the CSU Ethnic Studies Program and was distributed by email to all faculty in my college, um, which I responded to. Uh, then thought that was followed up by a statement uh, was put out by the American Academy of Religion, I think it is, AAR, uh, both of which used obviously eliminationist rhetoric. Uh, the, the, the basic norm is that uh, Israel is a settler colonial state and then, uh, for example, we had a banner, a legal banner put up on campus by my office that said uh, uh, that, you know, all, when involving colonialism, all resistance is justified. Uh, the, the university did, I complained and the university took that down. Um, so that's sort of the, the oh, and uh, when they, the second rally took place, you know, I urged the Jewish faculty group, I said, let's put up, let's put up the posters for hostages. We won't engage their rhetoric will just draw attention to the hostages in a, you know, that will be a very nonviolent uh, speech. And of course, uh, so we, we, we papered the campus with these posters, almost all of which were torn, either defaced or torn down the day of the rally. I had posters on my own uh, office. Uh, I have two bulletin boards in my office building that I control. To, uh, the one downstairs by the, uh, was torn, uh, the posters were torn down. I doubled, I then put up new posters, doubling the amount, and this time I stapled them. They're still there. Um, but it's been, um, so it's been difficult uh, to say the least on campus. Uh, the president, the university president, very short after, uh, after the massacres issued a general statement of condemnation of violence. After the posters went up with the paraglider, she specifically com com uh, condemned uh, the um, referred to them and talked about the uh, uh, condemned violent rhetoric and, and violent images. Um, we've had we have a Jewish affinity group. It was formed about a year ago for uh, for the uh, university as a whole. It was mostly just a social group and then kind of talking about general issues. We had a, an affinity group in my college that was founded in 2019. We produced a white paper on anti-Semitism in our college and the history of anti-Semitism that um, we're now working on one for the university as a whole. Since then, we've had like several emergency meetings. We did produce a statement of Jewish faculty. And last week, was it last week? Last, what did, I don't even remember, Monday, Monday. I don't, everything's happening so fast these days. We met with the VP for faculty affairs and basically we just unloaded on her and we're calling on the administration to you know, do anti-Semitism training for all admi administrators at all levels, from the university to the colleges, to the dean's office, and to department uh, staff. Um, the university, all we've been told so far is that the administration will be doing something, and they won't tell us what, uh, by the end of the week. Um, yesterday, we have a longstanding problem. Uh, so one of the issues that I've been pushing is Title VI, uh, Title VI guarantees that college campuses that receive federal funding, which we do, must be uh, not be a hostile environment for either teaching or learning or working. And so we have been pushing the administration that they are at risk of liability uh, for Title VI for allowing a hostile work environment, hostile learning environment. Uh, so we're hoping that we'll move them. We're uh, we have in my college a listserv that all faculty must be on, in which a lot of anti-Semitic things have been posted and uh, discussed. Uh, people are trying to get off the listserv. Um, the university, the college has not let them do that. The college finally said last week at a faculty council that you can. Oh yes, it's very simple. Well, five minutes. I'm still. I don't know if anyone has who's wanted to be removed has been. And uh, we have on our listserv um, 
a professor, some of you may have heard of Kevin McDonald, a uh, one of the leading anti-Semitic theoreticians in America, by which I mean he's a theoretician who's anti-Semitic. He formally retired from the university in 2014. He was in psychology. Um, he's still on our, our college listserv. I, again, uh, he's posting about these discussions on his anti-Semitic blog. Uh, so I sent a letter to the administra college administration saying, please take him off. Again, you know, citing what he said, uh, that was forwarded to the president and the provost, both of whom responded that they are working on it. Uh, so that's where we stand. Um, um, I just say um, very briefly uh, that uh, to my surprise, where this is coming from on our campus. So that there is the kind of um, usual suspects in sociology and international studies, uh, people who are either Palestinian or tied to uh, very close to Palestinian issues um, that are been pushing this. Uh, but what's really new is the role of Chicano and Latino studies and American Indian studies and their personnel on these issues. And they have um, they are seeing the Palestine issue as analogous to the fights over immigration in America and over um, the history of colonialization in America. And uh, and they and they see the Palestine issue as part of that struggle, and so they have become very very active, and that is very new. We used to have very good relations with Chicano Latino Studies. We did joint programming with them. Uh, since 2018, we've done nothing. It's you know the the sort of the the floor has fallen out. Anyway, I don't want to filibuster. I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Jeff, um, for sharing some of these deeply unsettling patterns that you're seeing on your campus. Um, of course, uh, uh, that's the, the reason we convene this panel. Every faculty member comes from a uh, different academic discipline and a different campus with different demographics and 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 uh, and student bodies. And so it's 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 interesting, but also deeply, deeply saddening to kind of hear hear what's happening on your campus, but inspiring to hear what you and your colleagues are doing to, um, to keep up the pressure on the administration to respond. So uh, now I will uh, turn it over to Brian. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rafa. So I'm Brian Englander. I am a professor of clinical radiology at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, I have been working in this space off and on informally since college, quite honestly. Um, getting more involved a few years ago, um, and Linda Landisman is on, through APHA um, and work that we're doing on a po policies that have been put forth, sort of anti-Israel, anti-Zionist policies, and we now have a very good, very strong policy um, on its way, um, but of course meeting resistance, especially with the start of the war. And that's been about three years. So where I got involved with Penn was about a, not quite a year ago, last March, um, a speaker was invited onto Penn's campus, I think Mohammed al Kurd, very controversial speaker. Um, we wrote a letter with a handful of signatures, got a lovely response from President McGill, who had just been president for eight months at that point. She came in July, 2022, um, and sort of things got quieted down. Then you fast forward to September and, the university unknowingly or knowingly um, was hosting the Palestine Rights Literature Festival, which was a multi-day event starting on Shabbat, um, Arab Yom Kippur, and lasting through the next three days, where we wrote an additional letter following up on a letter that had been written by the um, Anti-Defamation League and the Federation in Philadelphia saying this is not a good idea for Penn to be hosting it. Uh, Liz gave a response publicly that was meh wasn't a great response. You know, it would sort of condemn anti-Semitism, but um, she is a lawyer by training, um, uh, clerked under uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg and is a fulminant right to free speech, academic integrity, academic expression. Um, I think, you know, sort of to a fault if that's possible and said, you know, the university does not support this. It is individual departments and it's, you know, we're going to allow it. We're gonna increase a little bit of security and, and sort of a, a very tepid response. There had been some work in the background um, separate from our letter publicly and more publicly now by Ron Lauder and his, um, you know, who has given a lot of money to Penn and um, in his role with the World Jewish Congress and also um, funding the Lauder Institute. <clears throat> 
to stop the festival. Um, the university did not want to stop the festival. I think the weakest response came from the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, but you know, some others gave okay responses. And the private responses from Liz McGill to myself and to others was much more supportive. And Ron Lauder came out of one of those meetings saying, we have an ally um, in the president's office and she gets it. But I think what she didn't get was allowing that event to happen is what triggered you know, the continual um, sort of storm that has engulfed Penn um, since the war. So following the event or around the same time as, as the event, as expected, there were some anti-Semitic events. There was vandalism of the Hillel. Um, there was additional anti-Semitic events. And, um, you know, I, I guess, you know, focusing so much on third wave anti-Semitism, we forget that there's first and second wave anti-Semitism. So these were not individuals, you know, distinctly involved with the Palestine Rights um, Festival, but sort of took the opportunity to sort of express their distaste for Jews. Um, the event went on relatively um, not a lot of excitement. Some people who sat in said there was, you know, reported back that there was a lot of things that were said privately that were um, anti-Semitic, not just anti-Zionist. And really the event, even though the way it was conceived and presented was as a cultural event celebrating the culture, the arts, the literature, poetry of the Palestinians, um, really the fundamental part of it, um, as evidenced by Roger Waters being one of the invited speakers, um, as well as um, Mark Lamont Hill was to also, you know, condemn Israel's right to exist and, you know, all that we would expect it to be. Roger Waters was actually not, even though he was on the invitation list, he was not supposed to come on campus, but he decided to fly to Philadelphia and uh, be live on Penn's campus and security turned him away because they were not ready for Roger Waters to be on campus. And he made a big statement about it, how he was turned away. But the fact is he was never supposed to be live. He was always supposed to be a virtual participant. So, you know, given that context, we knew where this was going to go. Um, lots of people got very upset. Lots of alums got very upset. You know, Penn is sort of known or had been known as the Jewish Ivy. At some point, it was 30 percent Jewish back in the day. So you have lots of alums who sort of feel like this is their safe space. Um, huge alumni letters went out, donor letters. But I think, you know, it, it quieted down until the war. Then following the war, there was an initial, and I think a lot of presidents sort of just wanted to get something out. It was a really tepid kind of, we condemn violence, we condemn hate, we condemn the war, we condemn you know the killings um, that sort of went unnoticed. But shortly after that, Liz McGill um, issued a more formal letter, which was not an unreasonable letter. Um, you know, I, I think both sides of the issue or you know multiple sides of the issue weren't happy with it, the sort of output of the letter, but you know fundamentally she condemned um, the attacks by Hamas. She all but said we stand with Israel um, as much as she could as a university president, still trying to keep everyone sort of feeling that she's not picking one side versus the other. Then you have the donors, and the donors have made this into really national, if, if not international, news, um, you know, really driven not so much by Ron Lauder, though Ron Lauder certainly is one of them. Um, you know, his letter that he sent to her after this all happened was very moving and very powerful and basically saying that Liz McGill underestimated um, how close beneath the surface anti-Semitism existed. And by allowing even the festival to go unchecked and to say that the university is not sponsoring it, but individual um, departments are sponsoring it, really opened up you know, the gates. And then you know the war sort of leads to that and basically all hell breaks loose on campus. Though I will add that a lot of what I'm seeing in the news is not really representative of what the students are feeling and even what some of the faculty are feeling. There is a member of the Jewish Studies faculty um, who was from Israel who said people are no longer speaking to her or acknowledging her, even though she has been consistently unwilling to sign any of the letters that we've put forth because she wants to maintain a collegial aspect of you know, her job. So shortly after the war, um, and sort of things came to light. Some friends of mine, colleagues, I guess, I'd worked with in the past said, you know, we need to put something together. So um, we pulled together a letter and it took longer than I had hoped it would take. It took about a week to pull this letter together because I really wanted the right tone. I knew the tone was, we stand with Israel, but um, I actually needed people to dial me back. For anyone who knows me, I, I don't know where I fall on the political spectrum, but in this instance, I think I was coming off a little bit too much in a way that we would have had fewer people signing it. But I think the end result of the letter was still very firm. 
very consistent with what I believe, which is why you know I sort of put it forth and was willing to sort of initially sign it, but also recognize that we need to support our administration. I think Liz McGill, at the end of the day, is someone that we need to retain at Penn, despite all the calls for her ouster. Um, many of us fear if Liz McGill were to leave for some reason, we have no idea what the next uh, president of the university will look like or be like. And Liz McGill is, is a very um, intelligent, thoughtful, responsive individual. So, you know, as, as things went along, we, we pulled together this letter and we finally presented it to sort of public. When I got about two dozen or three dozen people to sign it. And the day that we publicly unveiled it, I actually sent it directly to Liz. And also being in medicine, our CEO, Kevin Mahoney, who is a, a good friend and, and I respect him quite as much, just saying, this is what we're doing. I want to give you a heads up. So, you know, not that there was anything in it that would really, you know, we weren't calling for her departure, but just so you're not, you know, surprised when this comes your way at some point. By the time the Daily of Pennsylvania, which is our school newspaper, um, published it in a story, which took longer also than I had hoped, we had about 300 plus signatures, and I think we're about 400 right now. Um, I think our biggest challenge has been that the majority of our signatures, not just got, I'm in the medical school and uh, the Penn Medicine, are from the medicine and from CHOP, and then Wharton follows. We've struggled to get the School of Arts and Science faculty to sign on, even people I know well, and I think I know their politics well, having known them for a long time, are very, very reluctant to sign on. Um, for one reason or another, um, even within couples, married people who both work at Penn, one will sign, one will not sign. With it going into the DP, we've had more sort of people signing on, um, which I think is a good thing. I think part of you know our initial sort of it just being one group was that it was word of mouth. So you know we sort of asked friends that we knew would be supportive rather than anyone that might challenge what um, we were presenting. Um, I think the other thing that was frustrating and continues to be frustrating, if you look at our list of 400 names, it's probably 375 Jewish names. Um, you know, or Jewish people, you know, I guess any name can be any name, um, and 25 who are not. So, you know, looking for that allyship has been not easy in the university setting. I think, you know, Penn is at this, this maelstrom of donor backlash and um, alumni backlash and even parent backlash. I'm on a, so um, secondarily, I have a son who is a freshman at Penn and he is from a Jewish day school and he is very active in Hillel, and he's in the Jewish singing group. And so he's very much in the community. He and his friends tell me they don't feel unsafe. They're not scared. They think the, you know, Liz McGill's response wasn't great, but they, they feel very safe on campus. They have a very strong community. But, you know, we do see, you know, even yesterday, there were things that were um, put up in the Penn Commons, which is center of campus, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. And then there's a new one from the sea to the river of Palestine, we will deliver, I guess, is, is the new one that they've come up with. Um, and his feeling is freedom of speech. But, you know, we've had conversations, and I think many of us have, you know, there's freedom of speech, and then there's violent speech. And, you know, what we in the letter intended and continue to intend to do was to condemn speech that incites violence, not questioning the right for people to feel what they feel and believe what they believe, to make sure that our students felt safe. The initial letter that came out at the Palestine Rights, Just Rights Festival was a letter from 36 prominent faculty supporting the festival. And um, the Senate faculty came out with a letter before ours was publicly revealed saying that we support you know, what President McGill's doing in freedom of speech. The um, AAUP pen, as expected, came out with a very um, essentially anti-Israel, anti-Semitic letter um, on behalf of the faculty. Um, and I will tell you, I was in that meeting quietly just sort of observing because I, you know, as a medicine faculty, I feel like I have a slightly different role within the university. Um, and the only voices that were being spoken during that meeting were, you know, th th there was no voice saying, what about the 250 that were kidnapped? What about the 400, 1400 people that were slaughtered and the ways that they were slaughtered? So the students felt that they had no allies within the faculty. And our goal was to show that the students, that they not only have allies, but that we are representing them and are there for them in whatever way. Liz McGill most recently came out with her, I guess her most recent letter was the her plan to combat anti-Semitism. It's a very good, very strong plan. Um, it was also sort of emotionally rejected by a lot of people because it, um, after the fact, mentioned that we're also going to be planning something to condemn Islamophobia, to support our Muslim and Arab students. 
um, once again, she's president of a huge university with a huge number of people. So um, I, I think the problem with her letter is that a lot of the Jewish parents and alums who are surprised by this, and, and I will tell you on a, on a personal note, I wasn't surprised by any of it, this. My mother survived the Holocaust. So my entire upbringing was sort of knowing where she came from and sort of what she told me throughout her life. I also have an Irish passport and was um, in the largest attack during the Troubles in 1998 up in the Yoma bombing. We were pulled out of the rubble. So I, I know what hate can do. And I'm um, very much sort of in, in, in that understanding and understanding that anti-Semitism has always lived just below the surface. Um, in you know families, you know if you have people who are not Jewish in your family, you know my my in-laws are from Ireland, and when I watch their posts on Instagram, they are as you would expect coming out of Ireland. There there is no consideration for anything Israel is going through. Um, it's just free Palestine, and they make the correlation between free Palestine to free dairy, which I can see how one can make that you know comparison from the IRA to the PLO back in the day, but the world is very different than what it was back when, you know, even when Arafat was um, leading the PLO. I think Penn is slowly healing. I think Penn is, um, in, you know, going to continue to be rattled by some of these events. Um, I think the plan to combat anti-Semitism is important. And I think she is meeting with a lot of people. To, I think on the 16th, I just heard she's meeting with um, Diane, who's coming in from Yad Vashem. We shared with her a private invitation um, that I'm supposed to be going to for a screening of the 43 minutes of footage coming out of Israel that they screened in Israel. I'm not sure if she's coming or not. I also shared it with Kevin Mahoney and a handful of other people. Um, I personally am not sure if I'm going, not because I, I, don't need, I, I don't need the proof of what happened. I think it's important for people who, not that they don't believe it, but really to um, see it and bear witness as I guess people are saying of what really occurred um, and it's pretty, actually extremely gruesome. So um, I, I will see, I, my plan is to attend that tonight. Um, and hopefully Liz will be there and hopefully other sort of members of the leadership will be there. We are, um, as you know, our follow-up as faculty, we are working very closely with Rabbi Gabe and Hillel to create um, a group to support students and um, sort of see how we can support what the administration is doing. They have a, uh, um, assigned the Dean of the Dental School to lead the combat on anti-Semitism group. Um, he has not decided what students, alums and whatnot will um, be chosen. In terms of the donors, I think, you know, I will take a tack that may or may not be popular. I think we have to be very careful. I've seen some of the speeches. Um, Mark Rowan is, you know, really leading this effort. And Mark Rowan is incredibly wealthy, incredibly smart person. But if you watch his business practices, um, morality is not a big part of his business practices. So, you know, the slash and burn is not how we can function in an academic institution. I think to allow donors to define the course of a um, university is very, very problematic. I think it, it's a slippery slope. And um, I graduated from Yale in 1994, and I sort of think of the story, the year that I graduated, the Bass family gave, I think, between 10 and $20 million to establish a Western civilization program. Yale University at the time declined the gift because that wasn't where they were moving. They didn't need the money for, you know, for that program. They wanted it for other programs. So the Bass family withdrew, and there was a huge backlash. Donors, you know, wrote letters and stopped giving and said, you know, Yale is not the Yale that you know, I once knew. And a few years later, they all came back. And I think Iran Lauder, um, you know, is a sensible, passionate individual. Um, I think, you know, this will settle out even in terms of donor backlash. And, you know, we'll just have to see, you know, there are enough donors that are not publicly, they're not as public as a John Huntsman or Mark Rowan or Iran Lauder um, that are still supporting the university. And um, the vice chair of the board is a Jewish woman who I think is regional director of AJC. I mean, very, very committed. Um, so I, I think that those are the people that we're not seeing in the news that are continuing to work from within. I think there's always that question of, do you quit and just say, I'm done? This is not, not a place for me. Or do you say, this is a place I love. And how can I use my influence and my, my, um, my ability to work with individuals in a way that we can make substantive improvements? I think one of our biggest struggles are the parents and some of the alums because they're not privy to a lot of things. They're getting bits of pieces of information and um, some of these sort of group, you know, I'm not a big social media person,
but um, some of these groups that I have been a part of, I've actually gotten off of because it's just not helpful what's being said. You know, whether, you know, parents doxing students, um, I, I think is not an ideal situation. You know, we had a student that has um, spoke very publicly at an event. I think she's a junior, looks, wants to go into journalism, um, is on some sort of a visa and, you know, said things that are pr highly problematic and, you know, the, the call for her to be ousted, you know, that's really up to the university ultimately. So um, I guess the only other thing that I would add is I have likewise, as a graduate of Yale, been working with a small group, um, one of whom is on campus, several of whom are in the media and sort of have done a lot of work in this field. And we're looking at how we can support our, you know, our fellow alums in this process, because I think the biggest part that many of us sometimes forget, or I sometimes forget is, you know, this will all play out how it's playing out. I'm not serving the army. I have volunteered if they need medical assistance to go over a handful of us are on the list um, that if they need someone to go over for, I'm a radiologist, there's not a tremendous need for that, but I have other skills as well. But one of my colleagues, a chair of orthopedics, I think has been called up um, to, you know, provide orthopedic care. That's, that's important and that's part of what you know, the individual can do. But I think you know, right now we need to make sure that our students feel safe, that our, our co-faculty feel safe, um, and that even our alums feel safe because I think none of us really feel safe. So it's really just through being together and supporting each other. And you know, it's, it's the power of the pen is I think much mightier than some of the other stuff that's being done. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, you're providing a model of how you can effectively manage or, or, or at least develop some form of consensus amongst these, these, these very disparate stakeholder groups. Um, and continue a dialogue with campus leaders so that so, so that the concerns of Jewish and Zionist faculty and students are, are, are being addressed. So last but absolutely not least, I wanna turn it over to Alan now. Thank you so much. You're, you're, you're very welcome, Rafa. And thank, thank you everybody. I, I've, I've learned a lot from, from listening even this morning and I've learned, uh, I've learned a lot and help, been helped a lot by working with AEN over the last uh, several years. And uh, when it came time to write my president uh, a letter this uh, past couple of weeks, I, I turned to uh, Miriam uh, and uh, of course it was very helpful. So let me, let me start by saying, speaking out a little bit about uh, kind of an existential thing. I'm very fortunate in the respect that I have a couple of colleagues in Judaic and Israel Studies. I'm the director of the OU Schusterman Center for Judaic and Israel Studies. Uh, there are only two other uh, Schusterman centers in the country, one at Brandeis and one at UT Austin. And I'm very fortunate that I have colleagues also uh, working on these issues with me, which I, I realize is a great privilege. Dr. Uh, Rona Seidelman, our Israel Studies Chair, and Dr. Hadas Kohn, who is an Israel Institute visiting uh, professor. And uh, I say that up front because I think it's important that my, uh, my interactions with the university are always modulated by the fact that uh, if I ask for something one week, I'm very likely to be needing their help in arranging a term of grant or a uh, an agreement from another department the next week in order to offer courses or field courses. So my my own moves forward are, I think, maybe a little bit more cautious than some of my colleagues today. I also want to just start by saying something about the existential state that we find ourselves in um, as Jews, my wife is Israeli. I spent a lot of time in Israel. I'm obviously in Jewish studies, so I've studied there and gotten a degree there myself. And uh, I, I want to I, I want to say that this is not detachable from the way we deal with this. Uh, I mean, one of the people we interviewed, uh, Dr. Chaim Katzman, Zichron Olav uh, uh one of the people we've interviewed for a position here was murdered uh, in the initial assault. So this is uh, very close to home. All of my wife's 
all of my wife's friends are children who are not really children. They're full-grown adults in their 30s uh, with kids of little kids of their own. Uh, many of them have been called up. Many of them are serving. And so um, it's quite impossible for me to be um, as dispassionate. I'm not, not to either be dispassionate or even to get the kind of emotional distance that maybe would be more desirable, but it's certainly not achievable. And I would say, in addition to that, all of us in Jewish and Israel studies who are dealing with this, and this is maybe true of everybody who's dealing with it on a first on the front line basis, because that's certainly how it feels. Uh, we're living in this kind of double uh, chronology where we are very following what's going on at every free hour, every single day, but most of our colleagues are not. And for them, it's a news item that is not that different from the war in Ukraine, or from any of the other horrible things that are going on in the world of which there are never any shortage. So it puts us in an odd position, I think. And I know I've gone from intense discussions about what letter to send and to whom about uh, in response to this or that and the other thing. And then I've gone in the next hour to some meeting of chairs and directors uh, talking about, you know, whatever, gateway courses, which I would find boring even under ordinary circumstances. And under these circumstances, I find um, nearly nearly a torment to have to sit through these when I feel like I could be doing something of, of much more value. So I, I think that a lot of us who are, are dealing with this uh, kind of need to acknowledge where we are. All of us know people uh, who have either been killed or whose uh, children are imperiled. Uh, I'm obviously I'm, I'm, I'm of the age where I'm not imperiled, nor uh, my uh, uh, immediate friends and family, but their kids are. And um, so I think that's that's a very real thing. Uh, University of Oklahoma, as you would guess, is uh, it's an R1 a public university. We have about 25,000 undergraduates, um, several thousand graduate students as well. Um, we are the flagship university of the state, which is both a good and a bad thing. It's usually a good thing, but in this instance, it's also the only place where there's real political activism happening uh, on the state campuses. Uh, you know, at other, other campuses, this is not, as far as I can tell from talking to our Hillel director, and she's the Oklahoma Hillel director, not just the OU Hill director. The only place where stuff, if I may say, where shit is happening is on the Norman campus. So uh, uh, again, it's nice to be in an R1. It's nice to be at a place where research is happening, but um, we're, feeling the, we're feeling the downside of it a little bit at the moment. Uh, we are, as you would guess, also being in Oklahoma, there is a lot of engineering and petroleum engineering and energy company connections. And consequently, uh, there are probably a lot more students from the Middle East um, than a lot of campuses uh, in other parts of the country might have. And uh, yeah, I think you can say that most of them are certainly pro to the extent that they're interested in politics, and not all are, are 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 very pro Palestine and not just pro Palestine, but anti Israel. And uh, you know, I walked in this morning. I thought if it, I, you'll take my word for it, so I don't need to ask Rifa to do it, it make me a co-host and share screen. I walked in this morning to uh, you know free Palestine. Uh, in front of my, in front of the building that I work in, in front of the office you see me in right now. And so, you know, I actually, I didn't know what to do. Do I say, and free the hostages? Do I, do, do, do I, you know, 
uh, do I just ignore it, which is what so far I've done. Uh, it's not violent rhetoric. It's not hostile rhetoric. So my incl inclination is to say, if somebody wants to write that, this is a, a university and we do believe in free speech and uh, they can write that. Uh, so sorry for this long-winded wind up, but uh, I think it's kind of necessary to see where uh, where I'm coming from uh, as the, again, as the head of Judaic and Israel studies, I'm very keen that my number one job uh, is really to educate our students about Israel and about Judaic studies. And so for me, I've hewed as closely as I can um, to that task. Um, and so let me, let me tell you a few of the things we've done. Um, and I, and, and I, you know, as I listen to my colleagues here, I, I feel, I feel like I have to figure out a way to be more activist about these matters, but, uh, let me tell you what we have done. Uh, uh, and so on, on the 13th, uh, we organized a, a pretty large website uh, post and also a, a webinar uh, hosted by uh, me, but uh, featuring our two Israel studies experts, and they really are experts. This is their field of study. And we had about 100 people, and we talked to them about October 7th and what that meant, um, mainly in terms of uh, of the Israel, uh, in terms of Israeli history, although I threw in a few remarks about uh, longer, uh, long durée Jewish history. I mean, uh, you know, again, this this slogan, I can't get it out of my head, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. However much uh, people want to say, well, it's really just a call for a one state solution. You know, anybody with any any awareness of Jewish history or even a, a rough awareness of re relatively more recent Middle Eastern history, certainly not my specialty, uh, uh, will find it hard to take much comfort in any denials that this uh, has genocidal intent or impact uh, when I think it so clearly does. Um, uh, so that I would say that is typical of quite a lot of the uh, uh, rhetoric that's gone on since October 7th, that um, only if you don't know anything at all does this sound uh, acceptable or non-threatening. But if you know even a little bit, and again, my specialty is the modern Jewish Bible, not uh, Middle Eastern studies. Uh, if you know even a little bit, though, it's very hard to not see this as threatening language. Um, uh, 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 when it crosses over into violent language, then I think we need to act. So we had a we had a webinar. Um, we posted on a website, and I was happy to see that the Western Jewish Studies Association and, and the Western Jewish Studies Association both adopted versions of our website post, which did take um, uh, of you know two or three days, not a week of back and forth, but it took two or three days of back and forth till we got something that everybody in our core faculty of five or six people plus 15 affiliated faculty in Judaic and Israeli studies could all feel comfortable signing on to. So that took a little bit of that took a little bit of work. And the next stage and the more the by far the most dramatic stage in our um encounter so far, although I will point out uh if in case I forget to mention it, um, this evening at the uh, large reform temple in Oklahoma City, Temple B'nai Israel, uh, me and Hadas Kohn and Rona Seidelman, the three principal Israeli studies people, are all doing a session up in the city, as they call it, as they call it in Norman, they refer to Oklahoma City as the city, which if you're from the Bronx sounds kind of funny. But uh, OK, uh, you know, uh, we go with we go with our local culture and we're going up to the city and we're going to talk about uh, these events. And I think it's going to be a less hostile. It's not going to be a hostile environment. It'll be a friendly environment, unlike yesterday when Rona and Hadas 
uh, were on a uh, a pretty heated webinar with um, uh, uh, a couple of people from Middle Eastern studies. Uh, again, whether we should have engaged with them at all, I acknowledge is questionable, but I think if it's an educational institution and we're trying to do education and we have people who are competent to speak, I think my proclivity is to say, yes, we should be engaging with other professors in Middle Eastern studies. Again, especially knowing that I'm going to have to get their get their acquiescence, not support, but at least acquiescence if I want to bring another Israel studies professor for another term uh, to the University of Oklahoma. So it gets pretty nuanced in terms of the politics. Um, but again, that's now, that's today, which happens to be Kristallnacht. So uh, if you're more, if you're more, uh, if you're more involved in German Jewish history than Israel history, which I am, that it's like ironic that uh, in a sick way that you know I'm going up to the city tonight to talk about Israel's state when what's really on my mind is what happened in the November 9th and 10th in 1938, uh, which I certainly know a lot more about. Um, but in in any event, the event which really required us to dive into the politics of it was a march of about 150 students with, um, you know, from the river to the sea, flags, banners, and so forth, uh, and uh, to the main administration building, but more importantly, the coverage they received in the OU Daily, uh, which is our student newspaper, which does in fact get pretty widely read, and the fact that the OU Daily to my, I wasn't aware they were going to do it. I sure wish they hadn't done it, but they published the demands of this unregistered student group called um, Students um, for uh, the Liberation of Palestine. It's not an official registered group by design so that they can't be held accountable to the same a degree, but they published uh, in the student newspaper a set of demands to the OU president. And I won't bore you with all the demands. In my opinion, they're nothing but uh, a call for BDS by other name, by without without using those initials. But it included, and here I will be specific because it it deals directly with the program that I direct. Um, uh, two, if the history of Palestine and Israel is to be taught at OU, instruction must be balanced and truthful. I would say the instruction is balanced and truthful. Three, as there are classes about Israel that only Israeli professors teach, we demand classes dedicated to Palestine taught by Palestinian professors. Um, I'm not, again, this is extremely um it, it, it's both insincere and uh, and and also uh, uh, evasive since we have um, a professor from Egypt and a professor who is um, uh, not Syrian himself, but his family is, who do teach this material. Uh, and 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 for uh, and here uh, was not that I was going to not do anything anyway, but four was certainly would have been enough on its own. Halt the funding of study abroad trips to Israel and cut ties with partner universities in Israel. Well, that's that's not the only thing we do, but it's at least a major limb, if not the heart, ble uh, the 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 beating heart of what we do at the Schusterman Center for Judaic and Israel Studies. So I had to, at that point there was simply no choice but to address the administration. Um, I consulted with uh, Dr. Rona Seidelman, who's the Israel Studies Chair. I consulted with Hadas Cohen, who's a visiting Israel Studies professor, funded by uh, largely by the Israel Institute, which I'm very thankful for. Uh, and, uh, you know, I wrote, uh, I didn't want it to fester or go unresponded to. So I wrote the letter the same day, and I didn't 
I didn't seek enormous consensus. It just f- turns out nobody had any problem with what I wrote. Um, but I felt that uh, alacrity was more important than whether or not I had a typo or uh, a bad word choice here and there. Uh, so that's what that's what I did. And I wrote to the president, um, Joseph Haroz, who is Lebanese American. I don't actually think that's critical, but it's uh it's certainly a factor and um i copied the provost the dean of students the director of uh equity inclusion and belonging uh the the dean of arts and sciences and at miriam's um uh at miriam's uh, suggestion which i thought was an excellent suggestion i added a line please reassure us that none of these demands uh, will be entertained after I had pretty thoroughly explained why each of these demands was either um, uh, completely in uh, insincere or disingenuous or um, outright um, misrepre- misrepresentation. So I did not yeah. hear. I did, uh, I'm sorry. Am I am I running out of time, Rafa? Um, I don't know what that noise was, but you're not. Um, it would be good if you uh, could wrap up in the next couple of minutes, so we have time for Q and A. We'll do so. Okay. So um, I, I sent this letter. Um, I did not hear back um, from the president. I'm very sorry to say we have gotten no presidential uh, um, uh, pronouncements. I guess the only thing that would be worse would be negative presidential pronouncements. Um, we have. His chief of staff um, did contact me almost immediately, and we had a very long and very, a very long and very frank discussion. And um, I made it very clear to him uh, uh, just how many, um, uh, uh, you know, just how many uh, faculty have written us in support, which is absolutely true. I, I let him know that the Jewish students at OU may not be in the thousands, but they are not inconsequential and in any case deserve to have their safety and security uh, protected. Um, I let him know that uh, 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 that the uh, he didn't really need to know this, but I reminded him that I knew all of the uh, very important Jewish donors to the University of Oklahoma I know that the uh, the Schustermans who support our program are the most famous, but they're actually not the only ones. And uh, there are plenty of others who probably uh, can be relied upon to say we don't really like vilification of our Jewish faculty or students. And um, I wish I could say um, that we're done with this because I'd love to go back to my 9 a.m. classes teaching about Samson Raphael Hirsch and Abraham Geiger, and knowing that at 1030, that was all I had to do to the for the day, except to work on my manuscripts and to go and to actually do what I'm supposed to be doing for my living and why I got in the business. But I know that's not the case, and I know that's not going to be the case for some time, uh, if ever. Um, so all I can say is um, I'm awfully glad that I have the support of faculty, friends, especially non-Jewish friends, especially non-Israelis, people who understand that even though they don't have skin in the game, they know that I do, and I don't take that for granted. And I think we should make sure, number one, not to take that for granted. So thank you very much. Thank you, Alan. Uh, those are very wise words to end on, the importance of, of finding allies and staying engaged even in the most difficult of times. Um, I'm going to stop the recording right now.